Um, you can turn in your Bibles, if you got them, to Revelation chapter 3, starting in verse 1. We're going back to our sermon series that we've been working through on the first couple chapters of the book of Revelation. We took a, took a pause for Easter, and now I want to go back and finish this up through the month of April. And so this, this church is the church of Sardis, and the emphasis toward this church is the call to stay awake. I remember when, um, when Kaylin, our oldest, was one years old, we decided as young parents that we wanted to go visit my family, my grandmother and grandfather, in upstate New York. A- at that time, we were, we were living in Hampton Roads, Virginia, so it was about a 10, maybe 11-hour drive. I don't know how, quite how long it was, but about 10-hour drive. But the tricky part about getting from the eastern shore of Virginia up to the Adirondacks of New York is that you have to drive through D.C., Philly, New Jersey, and all of New York City and the craziness around there. So like it may say eight to 10 hours on the GPS, but that can drastically change. So we being younger parents decided, let's drive through the night. This is perfect. Like Kaylin and Pam will sleep. Um, it'll be great. Like we'll wake up there. The kids will be fresh. Pam will be fresh. And I'll just kind of catch up as we go. And so any parents ever decide to go drive through the night? How does it work out for you? Oh, yeah, that, that's like a rookie parent move, right? Because, because it's 2 o'clock in the morning, and they're in the backseat going, when are we going to stop next? Can we go to McDonald's? Like, this is a, like, it's just, it is never a great, it's never worked out well for us. That was the one and only time we ever went through the night for something. And so I just remember going through that trip being the longest trip ever and just doing my best to stay awake. And, and when you drive long trips, like, Sometimes there's tricks you do to stay awake, right? Because you don't want to crash the car with your family in there. That's probably, probably a bad way to start vacation. But like, what are some of the things you guys do? Throw some things out there. When you're trying to stay awake, and kids, let's throw this. Let's say it's, it's Christmas and you're trying to stay awake for Christmas or, or it's a birthday or something big and you're just trying to stay awake. What are some tricks you do to stay awake? Let's hear it. Talk. Talk? Yeah, that, yeah, that works unless you're trying to get your kids to go to sleep. But yeah, Pam says, I'll stay up with you and we'll talk. She does that sometimes. I'll stay up and we'll talk. Uh, blast what? Blast ACDC? No, AC. Oh, no. either one works, right? Um, so blast the AC, turn the temperature up, turn, or turn the temperature down. I do that. Which? Coffee, music, windows. Did you just say? Windows down, yep. Slap yourself, I have 100% beat myself up. Like, come on, stay awake. Like, uh, car games? Yeah, like looking for license plates and everything else. Sugar, yep. Skittles will go a long way. Slap yourself, sugars. Roll the wind. I've definitely rolled the window down. When you get a little bit like this, I've def- I hit myself way too hard as a demonstration, guys. Like, I, my face is, t- <laughs> I, <laughs> I am probably red right now on this side of my face. Um, roll the windows down with something that was said. Um, pull over and take a break. You know what's funny about our new car? We normally drive junkers, um, but we, we bought our first new car last year because of the way the market was and everything else. And this car tells you when you need a break. Like, it's like, I'm, it's like we'll, it'll like send you a text message. It's like, sounds like you need a break. It feels, you're driving a little irregularly. You need a break. Yeah, it's never done that to me. Has it, Pam? Once, okay. <laughs> Once. Anyway, the point is, when you drive... Or when something big like Christmas is happening, kids, we want to stay awake because it's dangerous if we don't. It can be risky if we don't. There's, there's worries there. If you fall asleep while driving or if you fall asleep during important moments, you could lose your job, you could crash your car, you could hurt somebody. Like there is a danger, a real danger when we fail to stay awake, when we need to be awake. Now think about that in terms of your spiritual life and the church. There is a very real risk for every single one of us and collectively as a church for us spiritually to fall asleep, to drift, to to shut down. It says not just a physical threat of falling asleep while driving, fall asleep while doing something important, but this is actually a very real risk that we fall asleep in the middle of our faith and our church journey. 
And that's exactly what is being addressed here that, that, that in the passage we're going to look at, is that churches can drift from being alive and vibrant and awake to being complacent, to being kind of tucked into themselves, comfortable, and just completely checked out. The big word for today, kids, is complacency. Now, I know I, know I need to teach that word because we're going to use it over and over again. But when you're complacent, you just kind of check out. You don't care. Things are good enough. It's when you, it's like your, your grades are good enough. You don't, you don't really, you're just kind of like coasting through the classes. Or when your room is clean enough and you just kind of like, you just don't worry about the mess anymore. And when, when the game, you're, is, you might be losing, but you're just kind of like, eh, I don't really want to put the effort in anymore. You just kind of stand out there with your cross stick and hope for the best. You're complacent. You're just, you're happy with the way things are, whether they're good or bad or indifferent. You just are complacent. Being complacent, it sucks your energy, it dulls your attitudes, and, and good enough is kind of the key word here. Good enough becomes the word for our standards and the words for our tomorrow. Everything is just good enough. And so this church here, this church of Sardis, Jesus accuses them of essentially falling asleep, checking out, not caring, disengaged from mission, from fruit, and, and he condemns them with one of the harshest condemnations of all the letters. He says, you have a reputation of being alive, but you're actually dead. Like, you look good, you're going through the motions, but you're actually dead. Let me read these verses to you, and let's, let's talk about it some. Revelation chapter 3, starting in verse 1. We have three churches more to go. It says this, Write to the angel of the church in Sardis. Thus says the one who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars, I know your works. You have a reputation for being alive, but you are dead. Be alert, or some traditions say, wake up, be alert, and strengthen what remains which is about to die. For I have not found your works complete before my God. Remember then what you have received and heard. Keep it and repent. For you are not alert, and I will come like a thief, and you will have no idea at what hour I will come upon you. But you have a few people in Sardis who have not defiled their clothing. And they will walk with me in white because they are worthy. In the same way, the one who conquers will be dressed in white clothes and will never erase his name from the book of life but will acknowledge his name before my Father and before his angels. Let anyone who has ears to hear, hear, listen to what the Spirit says to the churches. Hey, let's pray and let's dive into this passage. So let's learn about the dangers and the warnings of spiritual complacency. God, thank you for this morning. Thank you for the chance to sing. Thank you for the chance to be here. Thank you for a chance to worship. And let God keep us warm as we learn. Don't let the cold distract us from what your truth is for us, but, but keep us engaged and alert and awake um, in all these things, God, so that we don't fall into spiritual complacency ourselves. Give us the cure. Give us the answers. Fight against our hearts that, that want to just be good enough or just be complacent, God, but help us to be vibrant and alive according to your metrics and definition. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So I think as Jesus confronts the church of Sardis for falling asleep, spiritually speaking. I think he gives us a cure as we kind of walk through what Jesus says. I think there are four, four cures, if you will, um, to help address spiritual and soul and church complacency. Four, four ways that we can dive in and address complacency. But before I talk about those, let me give you a little history lesson on the city of Sardis because this, it's almost, it's so amazing how this church has adopted the idea and tone of their community. In Sardis, Sardis was about 40 miles north of our last church, Thyatira. And it was, it was in the middle of, it was a very, at one point, it was a really important trade city. There were five major highways that connected. And so this city was really, really popular, but it had been in decline for a long time. It was like a city that like, 
once was, like if you have car, kids, you ever watch the movie Cars and they have like that, that one city on Route 66 that everybody loved, but then they built the highway and everyone just forgot about it until Lightning McQueen showed up and changed everything. That was not in my notes, but I think it makes sense. Like Sardis is that whatever, what was the name of that town? Radiator City, there we go. Sardis, Radiator Springs. Thank you. No, you're good. I wouldn't, have, I wouldn't have known any otherwise. You could have made something completely different name up, and I would have been fine. Radiator Springs. So Sardis is kind of like Radiator Springs. It was a big boy for a while, but over time, roots changed, and people started to, the city had been kind of in a bit of a decline. But one of the cool things about Sardis is that it was built on the side of a mountain. So it had incredible defenses. In fact, the city was considered impenetrable by regular attacks. 1,500 feet of straight-up walls, to, and there's only one way into the city. So super secure, super safe, super defensible. However, King Cyrus conquered them. And here's, here's what he did. All the times the cities were conquered, it was always through unconventional, unconventional means. What happens was Cyrus surrounded the city with the Persian forces. They retreated into the city of Sardis, and at night, Cyrus sent soldiers to scale their walls, like kind of like ninja moves, okay, in, this, in the night. They, they sent in soldiers at night to scale their walls, and when they got up on top of the walls, they found that the city of Sardis was so comfortable and confident in their defenses that, that his, the rumor of history says that there was not even a guard posted on the wall, that the soldiers just kind of like hopped their way up, and when they, they found the city asleep, and unconcerned about the army outside. And the funny thing was, that happened again a couple centuries later. Like the city, was, the city was so complacent and comfortable and overconfident that they didn't even bother to put a guard up. And it's funny because that's exactly what this church is being accused of. You're comfortable, you're confident, you have the reputation of being alive, but you're actually spiritually asleep, you're dead. In our lives, I think complacency is, I think about North America and our church and our souls and the complacency that we're at risk for. I think the two biggest factors for us today are busyness and comfort. Like spiritual complacency, I think the ingredients today are, we're just so busy that we don't think about what God wants. And we're probably too comfortable to feel the pressure to change sometimes. Comfort and busyness drive us to a place of complacency. So how do we fight against it? What's the cure? I think this letter gives us some ideas that I'm gonna have to go through relatively quickly. This, this might be a two-parter, but we'll see. Um, the first thing we do is discern the real situation. The first way we can fight against spiritual complacency is by discerning and seeing reality. Complacency will always be combated and fought against when we look beyond kind of what we need. We, we look beyond certain signs and whatnot, but we see, we see reality and the way things actually are. Like we've got to get a really clear view of the current situation to push against complacency. And look at, look at verse one. Here's what Jesus says. He masterfully points them to reality. Jesus says, write to the angel of the church in Sardis. Thus says the one who has seven spirits of God and seven stars. I know your works. You have a reputation for being alive, but you are dead. Jesus says, what people see is life, but what is the reality is you're dead. I know your works. I know the real deal. And Jesus doesn't, list, Jesus doesn't list their problems. You, you have this wrong, this wrong, and this wrong. He just says, people think you're doing great, but you're actually dead. You are actually dead. You think you're alive, but you're dead. The reality is you're dead. Now, what makes a dead church? What would make Jesus call this church dead? What, what makes a church die? There was an old joke, and it's not, I, don't, I don't think this is true, but I've been in churches where this could have been true. That there was a church where a church member happened to die during the middle of the worship service. And the paramedics came and they carried five people out before they found the person who was actually passed away. <laughs> Thank you, Jess. Like, I know it's not funny. It's not funny. 
But that was the, that, that, that's the joke of like, the church is so dead, it took him like five tries to figure out who actually had passed away. All right, bad joke, but thank you, Jess. I appreciate, I appreciate that. But, but think beyond that bad joke. When you picture a dead church, what are the, some of the images that pop in your head? Empty chairs, right? Probably an empty building, five or six people like spread throughout the worship service, uh, empty rooms, isolated things. Uh, maybe I think about like a, a broken down building up by Jordan's house. There's that one Baptist church that, um, is it, they knocked it down? Okay, it was, yeah, a church called Herald of Hope that was like, I mean, it was boarded up and like weeded up and like you just couldn't see anymore. But maybe we think about that, right? When we think about a dead church, we think about an empty building, just a handful of maybe faithful people, but a handful of people gathering and maybe an overgrown building, you know, power, needs some power washing, needs some mowing, uh, it's under maintenance. But the truth is that's not the image Jesus gives here. The image Jesus gives here is actually a church that would give the appearance of life. That they would be considered by, by many standards a vibrant, alive church. They're, they're going to look good. They probably had their best Easter ever last week. And they're going to have the gatherings. They're going to have the budget. They're going to have the full building. Jesus says you have a reputation of being alive, meaning that denominations and other churches are looking at you going, you're the church we want to be at. They're hosting conferences that says, hey, come be like us. This is a church that people think is killing it. But there's something wrong underneath the surface. The reality is they're dead. And here's the warning for you and I. There is a real danger in a church existing and gathering, but not actually doing anything for the kingdom, being dead. And the difference is fruit. I think what Jesus is getting at when he says, I know your works. What's being accomplished through the church is a fruitless ministry where there's no change, there's no witness, there's no concern for the neighborhood. There's no, there's no concern for holiness. The fruit is missing. And so there is, again, this real danger of giving the appearance of life. Vibrant worship services, full buildings, plenty of resources, but actually being dead. And Jesus makes this clear so many different places one of, the, one of the distinguishing marks of a healthy church, of a healthy believer, is fruit. Like that when, you're, when you are connected to the vine of Jesus Christ, when you, are, when you are abiding in him and you are connected to the vine, when you are remaining in him, you will produce fruit. And that's how you know you're alive. I have three apple trees in my backyard and I think one is dead. Want to know why? Because nothing is budding on it right now. It's like there's one branch that has like two buds that are trying so hard. But like the tree next to it's doing great. It's starting to bud and there's fruit that start, that's starting to come out. But I know that tree is dead because I look at it, it, it's still there. The bark's still there. The tree's still there. But I can look at it and there's no fruit. And so all winter long, it gave the appearance of being alive. Oh yeah, there's gonna be fruit. But it's actually dead. Spiritual fruit defines our spiritual health. We want to see transformation. We want to see multiplication. We want to see hearts change. You know what I also think is a, is a fruit of a genuine church? Um, persecution. The church of Sardis, there's no record of persecution. And that may be a good thing, right? Maybe they just had a really loving town that didn't want to pick on the Christians. But every other church was facing persecution at that time. But there's no mention of persecution here. You know what that makes me think? I wonder if they've so softened the gospel, so softened the, the offense of Jesus that nobody cared about them anymore. I know I'm kind of reading into the text there a little bit, but perhaps one of the reasons why there's no persecution mentioned here is because they weren't doing anything worth persecuting. The message of the gospel is inherently offensive. And then when you soften that, sure, everybody loves you. And so this church gave the appearance of being alive, but was actually dead. So the first thing we need to do is discern the real situation. So for you and I, families, kids, one of the things you need to ask yourself is be willing to ask hard questions about yourself, about our church, about our lives. 
what would Jesus see if he looked deep into my life and gave me a real evaluation, gave us a real evaluation? Do we have a reputation for being alive, but we're actually dead? We got to discern that and see that and cut to the core of that. So the first thing we need to do is see the reality, and Jesus helps us do that. Here's the second thing we do. We maintain a state of urgency. Complacency can exist with urgency. Complacency is kind of like the procrastinated, the Garfield, the like, I don't want to be bothered by doing things. But urgency is like the antithesis, the, the opposite of complacency. When you have a sense of urgency, it drives you on the mission. It helps you. And, and look what Jesus says in verse 2. He says this. He says, be alert. Other translations say, wake up. That's where I got the whole idea of sleeping here. Wake up, be alert, and strengthen what remains, which is about to die. For I have not found your works complete before my God. Wake up, strengthen what which remains, and go fix it. And this this command to wake up, there is there's so much we could go. We don't have time. Um, It's too cold in here. The kids are in here. We don't have time to walk through the entire um, biblical picture here. But the idea of spiritual alertness is all throughout Scripture. The idea of being alert, being awake, being on guard. You see that verse after verse after verse. I'll give you two of them. Mark chapter 13, verses 32 through 33 says this. He says, Now concerning that day or hour, no one knows. They're talking, by the way, in this verse, Jesus is talking about the day that he returns. And just in case you didn't know, it's probably not the eclipse on Tuesday. Just in case you get Facebook confused, just in case you start falling into the traps of whatever four moons or all these things that no one knows the hour or the day, neither the angels in heaven nor the sun, but only the Father. So in other words, probably not Tuesday. You can, you know, don't charge your credit cards up. But then he says this, watch, be alert, for you don't know When the time is coming, what Jesus is saying is stay in a posture of spiritual readiness and alertness, like a soldier ready to go to action. Stay awake and alert. For 1 Thessalonians 5, verses 6, Paul says the same sort of thing. He says, So then, let us not sleep like the rest, but let's stay awake and be self controlled. In other words, be alert, be awake. That's one of the key things about being a Christian is Christianity is not a passive sort of faith, but it's an active faith where we grow and we live and we press out our faith. It's not passive. We are supposed to be alert. We're supposed to be on guard. We're supposed to be awake in all of these things. And so that's the core of this command. Jesus is saying, wake up from your complacency. Stop checking out. And it's so easy to do. I found myself, even, even in the last couple years, seasons where whether it's busyness or struggle or discouragement, it's so easy just to check out and go through the motions. One more sermon, one more email, one more meeting, and you, just, you lose the drive to grow and to see Jesus do big things. And so we push against that because we are called to an active faith. And then he gives a second command, though, that's linked to this. He says, wake up and strengthen what remains. Basically, I want you to picture a campfire. We did a campfire on Easter. We love, that's one of our family traditions. We love, if you've never, if you've never roasted a peep, it's both, it's going to change your life, but it's also weird, okay? Because you take those little bunnies and you, you light them on fire. And um, they make the best s'mores because that caramelized sugar coating, oh, yeah, uh, Particularly if they're, if they're like crusty and old, like you can leave, leave them in the shelf for a couple months, okay? And then maybe a year and try it again. And so, so we do a campfire Easter. Reese's eggs make great s'more combinations too. So like, you know, diabetes is ready for you. God, smoosh that thing together and go for it. But so we did a campfire on Easter. And at, at any point, like if you've ever done a campfire before, there comes this critical moment, whether you're trying to keep the fire going, where... It, if you don't take action, the fire dies. Like you start to see some coals getting a little bit like loose, they're spread out. And what happens is you go and you stoke that fire, right? You move some things around, you flip a log, you add some stuff. But that's, that's the thing is when you're at a campfire and it's about to go out, you jump up and fix it or it will die. 
And that's exactly what Jesus is saying here. Strengthen what remains. Jump up, stoke that fire back to life. And I love that command because what Jesus does not say, Jesus does not say, get out of this poor church. Jesus does not say, go to the cool church down the street. Jesus does not say, it's time to like rip the bandaid off, this church is done. What Jesus, he, he calls the faithful of that church to not run away, but to stoke it back to life. And he pivots toward personal responsibility there. And that's so key because for all of us, when you see a church struggling, when you see others struggling, one of our keys is to take a responsibility to step in and strengthen it. He doesn't call us, Jesus does not call us to leave churches that are struggling, but to take personal responsibility to strengthen them. And so that's something we, we got to we lean into. So urgency is there. The fire is going out. Do something about it. Do something about it. And so I think, I think there's two. Let me give you two ideas to help really quick to help keep a sense of urgency. Let me go back to John 15, which I didn't read, but I mentioned. The more we abide in Jesus, the more I think we'll live for him. In other words, if you're trying to do life in your own strength, in your own mission, in your own busyness, it's really easy to fail to fully abide in Christ. But when you are vibrantly every day in God's word, abiding with Jesus, it will be like coffee for your faith. Coffee machine that won't burn out in the middle of a church service, but it will, it will keep you going. So abiding in Christ will help keep a sense of urgency. But then also I think keeping the mission the main thing. Distraction is one of the biggest enemies of complacency or biggest, I should say, sources of a lack of urgency and a complacency. When you're distracted to death, it's easy to skip Bible reading. It's easy to skip sharing Christ with your neighbors. It's easy to skip church when you're tired. Like distraction keeps us focused away from God's mission. But when, when the mission and fruit become the measure, it's, it's, it maintains that sense of urgency because that's what we measure for success. Like we, we look at how's God's mission being accomplished and where is the fruit? And everything else is secondary. How good the worship set sound doesn't matter if there's no fruit. How, how warm the building is doesn't matter if there's no fruit. Numbers don't matter if there's no fruit. Giving doesn't matter if there's no fruit. So at the end of the day, those things aren't bad, but the measure is the work of Jesus Christ. And when you keep the mission focused here, it creates urgency when the mission is failing or struggling or, or insufficient. So keep up a sense of urgency. Number three, let's, let's keep this up because I think we can do this. Keep to the basics. This is, very, this is very tied to what I just said. Keep to the basics. Do you want to fight complacency? Keep to the basics. Complacency can be complicated. In fact, I would imagine that there are a lot of dead churches that have very complicated churches. And I've seen this, I've pastored in this, like you've probably been in churches like this, but in, sometimes in dead churches, programs replace, replace a personal relationship with Jesus. Preferences rep replace a passion for Christ. Mundane replaces the mission for Jesus. And, and things get so complicated that we lose sight of the basics. Revelation chapter 3, verse 3 says this. Remember then what you have received and heard, keep it, and repent. And if you are not alert, I will come like a thief, and you'll have no idea what hour I will come upon you. Jesus basically just says, remember what you've received and heard, and keep it. What he's referring to is the gospel, the good news, the mission of Jesus, the the focus is there on Jesus and what he's done and what he's called us to do. Keep it simple will help to fight complacency. Alive churches don't overcomplicate things. They focus on the gospel and the mission. Everything else falls under that. So, so keep to the basics. And here's the beautiful thing. The good news of Jesus Christ is that we can be completely transformed in him. We are, we are made from dead 
to life. We are taken from broken to living. And so there's no room for complacency when we grasp the radical impact of the gospel. It doesn't, they don't go together because when you see the glory and the goodness and the mercy of Jesus and what he's done through, through or God of what he's done through Jesus Christ, you can't be complacent. You can't just go, oh, that's cool. Like you, you, are either, you either see Jesus and love him and are overwhelmed by him or you don't know Jesus to a degree because the gospel is amazing and there's no room for complacency when you see an amazing Jesus. And so some of us, the Bible says that we should repent. And that is, that is key when he says, remember what you've received and heard, keep it and repent. Now think about that. When I think about repentance before Jesus, kids, when you have to say you're sorry, like typically you think about big things. Like I, I hit my sister. I yelled at my parents. I cheated on a test. I did a bad thing. Like we think about, we think about repentance in, in terms of like big stuff. But the truth is a cold and a complacent spiritual heart is just as important for repentance as those big things. It requires an urgent repentance. Keep it basic and repent when we fail to remember the gospel. Now, here's the last thing as I, I kind of keep pressing through here. I don't have time to dig deep. Look to the future. If you want to fight against complacency, you got to have a future mindset. And Jesus reminds them of this. Kids are going to like this. Verse 4, he says, But you have a few people in Sardis who have not defiled their clothes. Now, and it says, and they walk with me in white. They will walk with me in white because they are worthy. In the same way, the one who conquers will be dressed in white clothes, and the one will never ease his name from the book of life, but will acknowledge his name before my Father and before his angels. Let anyone who he, with ears to hear listen to what the Spirit says to the churches. Jesus says, there are a few people in Sardis who have not defiled their clothing. Other translations actually say soiled their garments. Do you want to know what that actually means? Wet themselves. Um, the Bible is Bible's awesome. I love the Bible. There are a few people in Sardis who have not given up and uh, <laughs> just let themselves go. Um, it's, it is graphic and it's amazing. But the picture here is this. There are a few people who have maintained faithfulness. And Jesus says, there's a few people who have, who have maintained a heart for me, an attitude for me. They've not soiled themselves with the world, but they are, they are focused on me and they'll walk with me. And that's so encouraging that even in this dead church, there are faithful people. Keep, keep that in mind sometimes. It's frustrating. I've worked with churches. I've helped churches. I've coached churches. And sometimes you're like, where is the hope? Even in this church that Jesus calls the dead, they are faithful people. And notice the promise to those who are faithful. He goes, you will walk with me in white. That's a picture of his presence. You'll walk with me. Jesus says, they'll walk with me in white. In other words, that's a, that's a picture of Jesus' presence with them. Jesus is with these faithful believers. And then it says that, that they, will, um, they are worthy. There's a holiness, a cleansiness there. The gospel has taken root in their life. There's a worthiness, not because of them, but because of Jesus Christ and their walk with him. And then he keeps on going in verse, in verse five. He says, in the same way, the one who conquers will be dressed in white clothes and I will never erase his name from the book of life. Meaning they are secure, they are held, there's safety there. And then they're also supported by Christ. But Jesus says, but I will acknowledge his name before my father and his angels. Jesus literally says, I'll speak good of them before God and his angels. Those are some four really big promises for those who stay faithful, that Jesus would be with us, that, that we would know his worthiness, that we will be secure in, in, in our book of life, in his name, and that he will intercede for us before God. Those are things worth having in your life, in my life. That's a big promise. That's way better than comfort. That's way better than complacency to have Christ on your side. And so we need to have that future outlook. 
that future focus, that end zone mentality. Like when I watch soccer or football, I mean like, like American football, it's easy to get focused on the next 10 yards. And to a degree, we need to be focused on those next 10 yards. Like we want to get the first down. We want to, whether you're the Ravens or the Panthers, like you want to, you want to get, you want to get, I know, um, you want to get the Eagles fans over here, all you guys, any, I don't want to go that deep, but whether you are the Ravens or the Eagles or the Panthers or somebody, if you only focus on the next 10 yards, that's not the mission. The goal is the end zone. And so for Christians, it's really easy to get focused on just the next couple of steps. And while that's good, there's a, there's a much greater future glory that we're looking toward. And so that future focus will help to fight complacency. Complacency always leads you down the easiest path. But God's best, but that's never God's best for your future. Complacency is kind of like water. It just goes to the lowest point. But God has a different plan for us, and we want to pursue that. I, um, sometimes I run into people who have lost a lot of weight or have taken, um, go to the gym and swim a lot. And the, one, of the, one of the things when somebody takes, like, particularly people kind of my age or even older, when they start, to, they start to say, I want to be healthy for X, Y, and Z, oftentimes someone will, I've heard this said many times, I want to be around for my grandkids. You ever hear somebody say that when they're losing weight or getting healthy or trying to do like, I want to be around for my grandkids. They may not even have grandkids yet, but I want to be healthy and vibrant for my grandkids. That's a future focus, right? My, my next 20 years, I want to be around in 20 years. And so therefore, those peeps that Pastor Phil talked about roasting and those Reese's eggs, I'm not going to touch those things because what's more important to me than a campfire s'more is, is my grandkids and being around for them. Or I'm going to go to the gym on Monday morning because I know in 15 years, I want to be around and be able to chase and keep up with my grandkids. That's the kind of future focus we have here. When we say the trials, the temptations, the complacency, the busyness, the comfort, all those things pull my attention. But I want to, I want to focus on what Jesus has in the future. I want to focus on his promises. And so whatever I need to do today, when it's Monday morning and I'm cranky and I don't want to open up my Bible because I just want to go to work or I just want to be done or I want to sleep more, what drives us is that eternal future focus that says my time now with Jesus is more important than my crankiness and my Monday because the future is what I'm building. So that applies to so many different things. Future focused. What's best for eternity, not what's easiest and complacent. And so just to wrap this up, it's staying awake is tricky spiritually. Staying awake is tricky when you're driving. But we have to think about it as equally dangerous. Just as you would never want to fall asleep driving your car, you would never want to fall asleep spiritually walking with Christ. And these four things that Jesus brings up will help keep you there. Discern the reality. Are you complacent? Are you, do you have, your, do you have a reputation of being alive but are actually dead? Discern reality. Maintain urgency, keep it simple, focus on the gospel, and then lastly, keep a future focus. And those things will keep us going forward for Christ. Let's pray together as we wrap this thing up.